So we're going to finish up the discussion of muscles. Um, we already discussed kind of how a contraction is made, how a motor neuron signals that contraction to occur. Now we're going to look kind of more grossly at muscle movements and talk about how is muscle tension produced. So we were kind of looking down at the microscopic level at um, basically how one muscle fiber, you know, shortens. But in order for your muscles to do work, you have to have more than one, um, you know, muscle fiber doing work. You have to have a, a whole entire muscle and usually a group of muscles that are doing work together. And as those muscles contract, there are some properties of that contraction that produce more or less muscle tension. So we're going to look at several things that um, can increase muscle tension overall. Uh, then we'll look a little bit at muscle metabolism and end with a discussion uh, of isotonic versus isometric contractions. Uh, so let's begin looking at how different um, properties of the muscle can uh, produce more or less tension. So think of tension as just the, the strength of contraction or the ability to do work maybe is a better way to think about tension. Um, so tension can be increased by finding the optimum length of a muscle before contraction. And so what I mean by that, if you look at this graph here on the right, is that you can see that there's a particular um, range of muscle length which produces the greatest, the greatest amount of tension. It's kind of in this um, pink area here. So if the length of the muscle before contraction begins falls in this red area, then we will have maximum tension produced. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see the normal range, meaning the normal resting length of a muscle is typically between 1.6 micrometers and 2.6 mic micrometers. And we're talking about the length of, um, uh, of sarcomeres here. And this, the, the length of the sarcomeres is really related to the length of the muscle. So if I have um, an arm, for example, let's say, make my hand there. Let's say my arm is at 90 degrees. This, you know, biceps muscle is a particular length, right? But if I go ahead and stretch that arm out, then maybe you can appreciate that that biceps muscle is actually longer, right? By by opening up the arm, by extending the elbow, I actually lengthen the muscle, and by contracting the elbow, I actually shorten the muscle. So depending on how um, long or short the muscle is before contraction, that affects the maximum amount of tension that can be produced. And you see that if you are um, too short, so for example, if this arm was you know, way up here, and that muscle was even shorter, you would really have very little room left for contraction. So the amount of tension that you could produce would be minimal. In the same way, if you kind of hyperextend your arm um, and make it very long, like over here on this end, you're also gonna have reduced ability uh, to produce tension. Uh, let me uh, show you kind of at the sarcomere level what's happening there to help us understand why there's an optimum range, which we could probably have this purple range would be optimal. Um, so if the muscle is too short and the sarcomeres are too uh, contracted already, um, what you find is that there is a really little room left for contraction. So the actin filaments are almost already completely slid in as far as they can be and there's really not much more shortening that can be done, uh, and tension is produced by muscle shortening. So if you've already shortened the muscle before you even start contraction, there's very little room left, physically speaking, um, in order to produce more tension. And you can kind of see that um, on the picture over here. Now, on the other hand, if the 
sarcomeres are too long if the muscle is stretched out. What you can see is that you're lacking an overlap. So here's the myosin, and it wants to form cross bridges with the actin, but the actin is actually way over here, separated from the myosin to a degree where very few cross bridges can be made. So all of these myosin heads would love to form cross bridges with this actin, but because the actin is stretched out and pulled away from the myosin heads, cross bridges are not, not able to be formed, or only a few cross bridges can be formed. And you can imagine that each cross bridge, um, when that myosin head uh, kind of you know flips and slides the actin, the more myosin heads you have attached, the greater uh, the force of that contraction. So when you're overstretched, you don't make enough cross bridges and really you fail to produce very much tension. So we don't want the muscle length to be too short and we don't want the muscle length to be too long at the start of a contraction. We'd like it to be right in the middle in that sweet zone. So there's another um, property to muscles that can um, affect the amount of tension that can be produced in a muscle during contraction. So we already talked about muscle length. The second property here would be muscle twitch. And what we mean by that is uh, basically that when we talked about that excitation contraction coupling where you have the motor neuron releases neurotransmitter at the neuromuscular junction and then that uh, produces an action potential in the muscle that releases calcium that allows for binding of myosin onto actin and allows for the power stroke to happen. So that's that's kind of one, a muscle twitch would be one single episode of that excitation contraction coupling in one single muscle fiber. Uh, and so this picture over here to the left is just trying to help you see what that would look like in time and to see that of course, you get the stimulus, that's the, the neurotransmitter is released at the neuromuscular junction, and it takes you know just a small amount of time for that action potential uh, to reach down to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then calcium begins to be released, and as it's released, more and more uh, myosin heads can bind to actin molecules until you kind of reach a peak. And then, of course, eventually you're going to have relaxation of the muscle, you're going to have... Uh, removal of the neurotransmitter from the neuromuscular junction. You're gonna have pumping of the calcium from the sarcoplasm back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And as that happens, your muscle tension will reduce. So that's kind of what a, a normal um, build up to tension and relaxation after contraction looks like for a single muscle twitch. Okay, so we're gonna see next how um, changing the frequency of muscle twitches can actually help you build greater tension with subsequent twitches. So we'll see that here in the next. Oh, sorry, before we look at that, uh, I wanted to introduce this concept of different types of muscle. And so uh, in general, there are three kinds of muscle, what we call fast twitch, slow twitch, and then in between would be intermediate twitch, which would basically have properties of both fast and slow and would be kind of in the middle. And so what we mean by that is how long does it take that initial signal to produce maximum tension? So the fast twitch muscle, you can see here in the example, is the eye muscle. You can see how quickly, so the stimulus occurs here for all the muscles. But for the fast twitch muscle, you can see how quickly the tension rises and peaks, and then again how quickly it falls. So fast twitch muscle is going to give you a very quick, uh, but short-lived uh, amount of tension. And that's going to be important for uh, very precise, quick movements that need to be changed rapidly. So if you're talking about eye muscle movement, for example, and you're trying to follow a fly flying around the room, you can imagine how quickly your eyes are moving to try and stay focused on that fly. Uh, or perhaps someone playing the piano with great skill and all of their fingers are moving all around those uh, keys at different rates um, and how quickly you would have to change a contraction of different muscles in order to play you know, um, a great piece of music. And so those types of muscles require a very fast 
uh, action and you want that action to wear off quickly because you're often changing uh, the activity there. Slow twitch is used more often for things like um, uh, like postural muscles. So for example, I'm sitting in this chair as I give you this lecture, uh, and as I sit up straight, uh, I need my muscles to be contracting so that I don't slump over and fall out of my chair or hit my head on the iPad. And so my muscles uh, are contracting, and they'll be contracting for a long time uh, during this whole, um, the length of this lecture, they'll have to be contracting and holding me up for that whole entire time. Now, I don't need very precise movements with my back muscles to keep me uh, standing upright. I just kind of need sustained contraction, contraction that can last longer uh, without getting tired. And so um, you can see those muscles, they take a bit longer. If we look at this black one, they take a bit longer to rise and to reach maximum tension but they last longer and they relax a bit slower. And so your body is able to send less frequent signals and allow those muscles to stay contracted. Intermediate would be something in between. You can see gastrocnemius there is kind of in between the eye muscle and the soleus. Um, and you can see that it's gonna take a little bit longer to peak and it's gonna um, relax a little bit longer, take a little bit longer to relax than the fast uh, but it's going to be quicker than the slow. Uh, if we look at fast twitch muscle fibers, <clears throat> uh, we call these muscle fibers white. So for example, if you order white meat chicken when you go to KFC, that's the, the breast meat and the wing meat. So you can imagine when a bird is flying, um, although chickens don't fly, but you can imagine leftover from um, perhaps when they could fly a long time ago. Um, that the white meat on a bird uh, is their flying muscles because they have to beat their wings very quickly. And so they have a lot of fast twitch muscles in those areas and that's why we call that white meat. It actually looks a little bit um, lighter in color. You can see in the picture over here, the white muscle looks more pale than the red muscle or what we would call dark meat if we were talking about uh, animal muscle. So what makes it white and what makes it red is the presence of myoglobin. So myoglobin has a reddish color. Um, it's like hemoglobin, except it's, uh, it's like hemoglobin for the muscle. So it's a molecule that can, um, can uptake and transfer oxygen from the capillaries down deeper into the muscle uh, so that the muscles can perform um, aerobic respiration and produce more ATP. So... White muscle is in fact low in myoglobin because remember, it's not really giving you sustained contractions. It's gonna give you kind of more quick uh, movements. And so it actually uses glycogen stores uh, within itself to, uh, to get most of the energy that it needs from ATP. So it's very low in myoglobin. It doesn't do a lot of aerobic respiration. There are a few mit mitochondria for the same reason. And together it kind of gives it this light, lighter color. So they reach their peak tension quickly, but they're also going to fatigue quickly because they're not able to uh, kind of replenish that ATP that they used. When that glycogen is used up and the ATP that comes from that is gone, uh, then basically they're tired and won't be able to contract anymore. Slow twitch muscle fibers, what we call red muscle, uh, you can imagine they're pretty much the opposite. They're high in myoglobin content. They have lots of mitochondria. They have a really good blood supply because they want to be replenished with oxygen that will bind to that myoglobin. The myoglobin will take it deep into the muscle. The muscle can perform aerobic respiration, and so it can contract over a long period of time. So example, you know, if you're walking, so you're talking about leg muscles like soleus, uh, we're talking about back and postural muscles, some of your abdominal muscles. These muscles that need to be contracting for a long period of time uh, but don't need to be so precise. Um, those ones are typically going to have more slow twitch or red muscle fibers. And because they use aerobic respiration, because they have a good oxygen supply due to the myoglobin content, um, they're able to last a lot longer. Okay, <clears throat> so back to the idea of muscle twitch, which is where we started here, and tension. So I showed you the graph of, of one muscle twitch, how it you know, you get your stimulus, it takes a little bit of time for that action potential, 
but then you get a rise and you get relaxation phase as well. Well, what the body does in order to increase the strength of tension, in order to increase the amount of work that that muscle can do, is it will um, give multiple twitches in a row, and the more twitches that it sends, the more you know electric signals and the more action potentials that it sends to that muscle fiber in a row, the stronger each subsequent um, muscle twitch will be. So if we look here on the A, you don't really have to learn the word trep. Um, I just want you to understand the concept that if you increase the frequency of stimuli, if you, if you give one stimulus right after another, you'll see that the strength of each individual twitch increases. So you notice here is the first twitch, and then you give another signal, the second twitch, and another th signal, the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth. And you can see that each one gets a little bit stronger. So that's one way that the body increases the amount of tension produced in the muscle. Now we can do this even more with what we call wave summation if you don't wait for the muscle to fully relax. So somewhere before the relaxation, relaxation reaches completion, you give another stimulus. And you'll see you get that increase in tension, and then you give another stimulus before that relaxes, and you get an increase. And again, you give another stimulus before you get full relaxation. And you can see how that will actually build tension uh, quite quickly and quite strongly. And this is what the body does to help us build tension in our muscle so that we can do greater work and lift heavier objects. <clears throat> so eventually, if you continue to give stimuli before the muscles were allowed to relax, you would eventually reach a maximum amount of tension that that muscle can produce. And you would kind of sustain that maximum amount of tension. Uh, and when you get a sustained maximum amount of tension, we call that tetanus. And that's kind of where the disease tetanus comes from. The disease tetanus gives you severe muscle spasms uh, and, and contractions that um, are very painful and they don't relax. Eventually, if your diaphragm becomes tetanic, uh, then you will not be able to breathe and that's how people die from tetanus. Um, but our bodies use tetanus in a more controlled manner to kind of give us maximum uh, strength of tension. And it does that by just giving that um, um, kind of um, stimulation before you get relaxation. Um, it goes awry, however, um, in, in what we would call muscle cramps. So if you've ever woken up in the middle of the night and kind of had this uncontrollable cramp, like in your calf muscle, for example, and wondered, you know, what's going on and how do I get this thing to break? It just won't stop contracting. It's because that muscle has been stimulated uh, multiple times without allowing it to relax and it's now reached maximum contraction um, and you're, you usually have to do something to break that. You have to physically uh, you know, grab your foot and pull it back in order to stretch through that contraction. And that would be a, a tetanic uh, contraction as well. <coughs> okay, so a third way that your body uh, helps to increase tension. Remember, we're talking about ways the body uh, produces more tension so that we can do more work with the muscle. So um, the third way here that you can see on this slide is the idea of motor units. Um, so often muscles are grouped together so that one motor neuron may feed multiple muscle fibers. And so then within one muscle group, like let's say we're talking about your biceps muscle, um, you may have several motor units there in the biceps and the spinal cord and the brain can really direct its signal to only one motor unit if it just kind of needs a little bit of tension to do a little bit of work. Or it can send multiple messages to multiple motor units uh, in order to kind of produce a more maximum tension. So you can see here in the picture, let's say we've got a spinal cord and we've got three motor neurons. You see that? The purple, the blue, and the red. And each of those motor neurons is controlling a particular group of muscles. So the red ones you can see controlling these red. And so they've color-coded it for us, which is great. So each of those units that is 
controlled by a single motor neuron, we call that a motor unit. So you can see I have motor unit one, motor unit two, and motor unit three. So if the body wants just a little bit of tension to do a little bit of work, maybe the spinal cord just sends an action potential down the motor unit one, and it activates these muscles, and you get some tension, some muscle contraction, maybe, say, to lift up your cell phone. Uh, but let's say you need to lift up something quite a bit heavier. Let's say you need to lift up um, like um, a 50-pound suitcase, for example. Well, you're going to need more than just motor unit one fibers. You're probably going to activate motor unit one, motor unit two, and motor unit three, and you're going to get action potential sent down all three of those motor axons so that you can recruit all of those muscle fibers to contract. And then that's going to give you obviously increased muscle tension so that you can do an increased amount of work. All right, so we looked at three ways that your body can increase muscle tension. We looked at the, the relationship between length and tension, um, between um, kind of twitch and tension and the different kinds of muscles, slow twitch and fast twitch and intermediate twitch in between. Um, and then we looked at motor units. So those were the three um, ways, and there's more than that, but those are the three that we focused on, three primary ways that your um, body increases muscle tension. Okay, I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk um, just briefly about muscle metabolism because we talked about uh, glycolysis and cellular metabolism and cellular respiration and how the body makes ATP from glucose, um, and that's <clears throat> that's true in much of the body. It is also true um, in muscle. The muscle does break down glucose, um, at least in the red muscle. It does this more, um, but it does break down glucose through glycolysis, just like we learned, and produce a bunch of ATP. The problem is, especially if you need sustained contraction, that ATP is used up rather quickly and it's not able to be made quick enough to sustain contraction. And so the body has developed um, kind of a backup system to cellular, to, to aerobic cellular respiration in the muscle. So in addition to doing aerobic respiration, the body also stores energy uh, in another molecule besides ATP. So ATP we already looked at and that's true, but in muscle there's a kind of a backup system and the body uses something called creatine phosphate. So we talked about adenosine triphosphate, right? And adenosine diphosphate. So this is creatine phosphate. And so it's just a way of um, storing, remember the, the, the energy in ATP comes from that, um, you could say it's adenosine with three Ps, right? With three phosphates. And it's really this final phosphate bond that contains the energy, and so when that bond is hydrolyzed, um, that's when we get our energy. Well, the same thing's gonna happen here with creatine phosphate. So when creatine uh, releases its phosphate, then you're gonna get energy, um, and that energy is gonna be able to be used uh, for muscle contraction, actually, to replenish the ATP. So this is how muscle can continue to contract even after it's kind of blown through its initial um, stores of ATP because it has a, a backup. It has uh, creatine phosphate, which can also donate phosphates to ADP and make ATP. So even when your ATP is gone, you can make more ATP just by transferring a phosphate from creatine phosphate to ADP, and that gives you ATP. So we're just gonna kind of go through what muscle metabolism looks uh, like at rest and kind of at maximum effort, uh, just to kind of show you what this looks like. So think about a muscle at rest, it's not really contracting, but there's still, the blood is still bringing glucose to the muscle, and those muscle cells are still doing aerobic respiration, and those muscle fibers are still producing ATP, right? So uh, fatty acids come in, uh, glucose comes in here, um, and both of them are being used to make ATP. So you get a excess of ATP. Um, in fact, you get so much ATP that the body stores some of that excess ATP as creatine phosphate. 
So at rest, you're making both ATP and, and any excess ATP is being translated or transferred into creatine phosphate for uh, later use. So you have an excess there of both ATP and creatine phosphate at rest. However, when you have heavy work, uh, what's going to happen is you're going to get the glycogen stores from the excess glucose that were stored um, are going to uh, be changed into glucose and glucose will go through glycolysis. And now, especially if you're in, um, uh, let's say, a white muscle that doesn't actually do a lot of aerobic respiration, you're going to get glucose to pyruvate, you're going to get your 2 ATP, and then the rest is going to go as lactate. Um, so when you use up all of those ATP, which is not, uh, not very much, you're going to need uh, your backup. So at that time, your creatine phosphate will give its phosphate to ADP, and you'll make more ATP, uh, and that's kind of how you can sustain muscle activity even when you run out of ATP. The lactic acid that's produced, um, some of it gets absorbed into the blood, of course, eventually all of it will be uh, up, uh, taken up into the blood supply, but while it's hanging around in the muscle, that gives you that feeling of muscle fatigue. Okay, last thing I want to talk about here is the concept of isometric versus isotonic contraction. Um, these are two types of contraction that both produce tension. They both uh, produce contraction of the muscle. The difference is going to be in the length of the muscle. Isotonic contraction, I think, is the simplest one to understand, so we'll start with that one. Isotonic contraction is what we think of when we think of our muscle contracting. Uh, let's say you're watching this um, video on your iPad and you pick your iPad up off of the table or off of your lap or wherever it was. When you pick that iPad up, what happened is that the tension produced in your muscle became greater than the weight of that iPad. Not hard to do because the iPad is not very heavy. But in order to pick that iPad up, it had to overcome the force of that iPad generated by gravity's pull, and that muscle had to shorten. If the muscle does not shorten, then your arm will not contract. And if your arm does not contract, then you will not be able to pick up your iPad. So isotonic contraction is when the tension in the muscle overcomes the force of gravity on that object or whatever force is opposing you, uh, and the muscle is able to shorten and to make that load move, okay? So the picture here is just showing you a two kilogram weight. And so as the muscle, you can see the muscle is kind of this long, and as the muscle contracts, it's shorter, right? So this is shorter, this is longer. So it not only overcomes the load and lifts the load, but the muscle also shortens. So you can think of isotonic contraction in those two ways, shortening of the muscle and movement of the load. Isometric contraction is sometimes a little bit more difficult to understand because what happens here is we are still producing tension. We are still having contraction of individual muscle fibers, but we are not having contraction of the overall muscle. So the length of the overall muscle remains constant even though individual sarcomeres are contracting. And the reason this happens is because the force that's generated by the contraction of those individual myofibrils is not enough to overcome the load. So in this case, we're talking about a six kilogram weight, three times the weight of our last example. Um, and you know, in, in terms that we might understand, let's say for me, let's say it's a 200 pound, um, you know, uh, metal battery that I'm supposed to try to lift. And I may with one hand you know, struggle to lift that 200 pound object off the ground with one hand, but I'm just not able to overcome the weight of that object. And so I pull and I pull and I pull. I'm producing all kinds of tension. Um, you can feel my muscle. My muscle will be rock hard, uh, which is proof of the tension as I try and lift that weight, but the weight is just too heavy and I'm unable to actually lift it up off the ground. So this would be isometric contraction, where my muscle is still uh, becoming firm, still contracting, but it is not able to lift the load. And actually, if you measured the length of my muscle from beginning to end, from tendon to tendon, 
you would see that the overall length of my muscle does not change. So isometric contraction, the length does not change, and the load is not removed, but individual muscle fibers are contracting. So how is it possible that individual fibers can be contracting, but the muscle as a whole does not? That's what we'll look at here on this page. So the muscle itself, if we look at um, uh, the kind of the totality of the muscle, if you guys remember from anatomy, muscles are attached to bone uh, with tendons. And tendons have some elastic elements in them. They have some elastic fibers. And so what happens during isometric contraction, which is going to be number two here in the picture, so number one would be the muscle at rest. You see that the sarcomeres are not shortened. They're not really overlapping very much. They're at rest. They're relaxing. You'll see that the elastic elements in that case are also relaxing and are not stretched out. They're, they're fairly compressed at this time. Okay, so let's move on to isometric contraction. So we first apply some force to that object that we're trying to move, and we begin to contract uh, individual muscle fibers or sarcomeres, and you can see we're starting to get some overlap here of the sarcomeres, right? So the sarcomeres are actually shortening. Look at the distance between here and here, and the distance between here and here. It has shortened. So there is shortening at the, at the muscle fiber or sarcomere level, but notice what's happened to the elastic elements. They have lengthened. So you get shortening at the sarcomere, but you get lengthening at the elastic element. And what that results in is muscle tension because you've got shortening of sarcomeres. You've got contraction happening. But you actually get no shortening of the overall muscle. Notice how it's the same length as the muscle at rest because you had stretching of the elastic elements. <clears throat> now, if you're able to produce enough tension so that you can actually pick that object up off the ground, you will get, of course, more shortening here at the sarcomere level. And that shortening will eventually be too much for the elastic elements to contain, and you will get an overall shortening of the muscle. <clears throat> Excuse me, at that point, the contraction becomes isotonic. So isometric versus isotonic. Make sure you, um, you're clear on the differences there. Okay, so um, this is for you guys to watch. Uh, hopefully you'll be watching this um, Monday during class time. Uh, at least make sure you watch it before we meet together on Friday. Remember, your test will be Wednesday. Um, mostly multiple choice, but there will be two or three short answer questions that will likely have to do with processes such as the process of vision, the process of hearing, um, or the process of um, the, the, those five steps that we talked about that every reflex has, things like that. So make sure you study hard and prepare, and I'll see you all on Tuesday for lab. Make sure you come to the anatomy lab and that you're dressed appropriately uh, to deal with that sheep's blood. See you all then.